All right, so next up, uh, we have both Dave and Catherine here speaking on avoiding default passwords and secret breaches using open source, so please welcome, welcome them to the TourCon stage. All right, thanks. Um, so Dave Dietrich, um, been at the University of Washington for quite a while, programmer, system administrator, security operations. When Simple Nomad was talking about history and DDoS, I was involved in writing the first five analyses of those tools and in trying to get thousands of people on the campus to figure out how to secure their machines. I became a big proponent of Newton's third law of vulnerability disclosure, which is for every vulnerability that you disclose, identify and disclose, there should be an equal and opposite mitigation. So that's part of the, the motivation for the talk here. And I'm Catherine Carpenter. I'm a business consultant in information security and privacy with a background in healthcare and ethics. I'm also the founder of Zerzura Advisors and a licensed attorney, so I have to warn you, none of this is legal advice. But your future lawyers may thank you if you listen to our ideas. Um, Dave and I first wrote about the ad default admin password problem in 2014 when we discussed the ethics of the Karna botnet and using the data it produced and we've been working in this field since then educating and advocating about ethical information security research and working to find ways to better protect information data and privacy some of the work that went into this presentation was funded by a Comcast open source innovation grant okay the beginning of our presentation covers topics you're familiar with Slide. It's not. <laughs> oh, the slides aren't connected to that. Let's see. I thought that would go over automatically. Let's see. Well. Sorry. So I'm gonna go just keep, keep talking while he sets things up. The beginning of our co of our presentation covers topics you're already familiar with, and our goal is to get developers to think differently and and behave differently when managing secrets and handling secrets. Um, I'll begin our presentation with a discussion of secrets and a very fundamental question. What is a secret? Switch over. What is a secret? Well... Yeah. It seems to be. Is there a switch? Yeah, there is. I apologize, I didn't realize that uh, someone switched it over. I thought it was automatic. <laughs> that would be intelligent. I'll walk to the room and make sure you get her up. Wait, you were? Oh, no, I was on the agenda. There we go. Okay, I'm sorry. Perfect. Yep, no problem. Sorry, Just everybody. All right, so we're going to use Jeff Mitchell's definition of a secret, and that is something that will elevate your risk if exposed to unauthorized entities. This kind of information used with networked computers and applications generally controls access or identifies a user to a service, and for that reason, an exposed secret is a threat to the user or the system. And identifiers are related to secrets, um, but they have different levels of sensitivity. An identifier like a username may be exposed without causing harm. In some cases, an identifier must be shared for technology to work. For example, DNS text record used by DKIM protocols to prevent email spoofing. And in all cases, a secret that is exposed causes harm to the user or the system. In open source software projects, you'll generally need to deal with the following types of secrets. Passwords, either as clear text, salted and hashed, strings stored on a system that does the hashing and compares the hashes, bearer tokens, long strings of characters rep representing large numbers, including cookies, API tokens, and JSON web tokens that represent an authenticated user when presented to the server. These are more complex than passwords, and so they're not usually entered manually. They're stored in computer memory. 
but just like passwords, they require a secured transport mechanism to stay secret. And private keys are the private component of public private keys, all used for encryption. Um, and for any public private key pair, the private key must remain secret. So where do secrets come from? You can create them yourself. If it's a password, you make it up. You can generate it automatically using a system, and sometimes you need to get them from somewhere else, like a service you're using. If the service generates it, and you have to retrieve it from them, like if Amazon generates a service, you retrieve it from the AWS panel, or you get a key, a access to a product key for a licensed product. So there's there's a secret distribution di distribution problem. Whenever you're trying to share secrets with someone, if all of you need access to the same service, and one problem we address with this presentation is how you might share or distribute secrets to others who need them differently than you may now. Looking at complexities about dealing with harms and ensuring information is how you want it to be, information resides in and goes between information systems. And sometimes it floats around on hard drives too. There are three main attributes to inter information assurance, availability, integrity, and confidentiality. And authentication is important because we're talking about passwords. Um, we're also discussing protection and reaction capabilities. Mostly we'll talk about that later, but it's important to consider reaction capabilities as a way to mitigate problematic situations. For example, an intrusion of your system or a breach or leak of data. We'll discuss availability, integrity, and confidentiality in the next few slides. Information compromise can cause harm if the information is changed or altered, and that change compromises the integrity of the information because it changes the meaning of the information. For example, change a buy order to a sell order, change a paycheck from $2,000 to $200. That changes the integrity of the information. When information is deleted or encrypted, there's harm because the availability of the information is compromised, and it is no longer available unless you have the key to decrypt it. If deleted, while there's the potential for recovery, there's at least a temporary harm to the availability of the data. If the information that's intended to be private is leaked to the public, the confidentiality of the information is compromised because that information is no longer private. So, Looking at second downstream harms, secondary effects, leaks of credentials allow systems, uh, allow an unauthorized user access to a system. And that compromises the integrity of the system because an unauthorized person has access to the system and can now modify files or access, the, or access to the system. Since an unauthorized person is able to view the files, their confidentiality is also likely compromised. Encrypting a file alters the integrity of the file because it changes the file. It's no longer in its original form. And ransomware compromises the availability of data or information because it becomes unreadable without the key. If ransomware happens to encrypt critical system files, the files are no longer available and the system could crash or refuse to boot up. Our goal is to minimize harm and speed up the mitigation process. So we're going to talk about what goes on in the real world um, we'll begin by looking at the complexity of the group that will use some secrets. So you're just one person. There's no sharing or distribution problem, but there still is a default password problem. There's a small federated group, say a trusted group, the same community or Slack channel. Then there's a, a distribution problem, but in this context, you might set up a central protected server to share secrets, and the turnover of the group may be limited. That is an assumption. Um, Take a set of federated organizational units, say a commercial group, its product developers, the, and open source developers within the same organization, and the group responsible for identity management, all at the same organization. Say there's a vault server and only employees have access, authorized access to the internal network. In this context, there's no sharing of services with developers outside the company. If open source developers from outside the federated group are aiming to participate in a project, secrets must be shared outside the identity management group, and that leads to a confederated set of pre-existing groups or individuals. Confederated here means there's a common goal, but less trust because the outside participants are non-employees. There's still possibly some degree of personal trust. What is limited, although, although trust is limited. Um, here, there are no credentials going from the identity management group to 
the outside individuals, but you need a way to transmit secrets, facilitate sharing new secrets, and generate or revoke secrets from people who are no longer trusted. Oh, went too fast. The secret distribution problem can be summed up this way. You need a method for creating and sharing secrets, also for generating and revoking secrets. As the size of the group grows, the sharing of secrets become more complex, and another thing that impacts the distribution or um, revocation of secrets is how frequently the membership of the group changes. So I want to, I want to um, get a Raspberry Pi. And this is the, the, first, the first of the problems, is the default admin password problem. If you get a Raspberry Pi, you can log in as the default user Pi, and the password is Raspberry. Pi has pseudo access. Changing the password is best practice, but it's only discretionary, and that's just Raspberry Pi. Any open source technology potentially has a default password. So this problem is actually predated the internet. Uh, the Morris Worm and the ARPANET, uh, two modules that it had, 432 common English words or names. Um, as well as a module that would take the account, it would look through the password file, find the account name, try that as the password, try no password as the password. Quite effective. Uh, and there have been researchers over the years who have found vulnerabilities in things like commodity or uh, consumer uh, wireless access points, uh, routers, things like that. There's a big list of all these default common defaults that's available. It's used by a whole bunch of tools. And that's been exploited despite people like um, David Feifeld at um, Black Hat showing Nmap scripting engine being used to go out and scan for, in this case, his camera at home, uh, finding it, trying a default password, getting in. And uh, Simple Nomad was mentioning the DDoS attacks that have been happening lately from IoT devices. So I look back after the Mirai botnet came out, this is a Venn diagram. I went through the passwords that were used by these tools to gain access to these systems, and you'll see that it, there's a massive overlap. The big gigantic bubble there is a program called BR.C that was floating around in like the late 1990s or early 2000s. Uh, brute force on SSH, embedded list of over 50,000 passwords. Um, some of those passwords indicated that there were some military sites that had common passwords. The reason being the passwords and the account names indicated the bases where these accounts existed. So um, that's one of the main things we've got to get rid of. For those of you that saw the truffle hog talk a moment ago, the embedded secrets in source code problem, and one of the main things that he was saying start to put the search for these things as an audit mechanism into the DevOps chain. Um, that gives you the ability to keep the secrets from being breached in the first place. All right, so this might be duplicative of the truffle hog talk also, because I, I think he mentioned Uber, but um, two hackers found credentials in a private GitHub repo and used them to access Uber data stored on AWS around October 2016, and it was only publicized about a year later. Um, the attackers found personal information for 57 million customers and drivers. They also found 600,000 driver's licenses, um, which that alone triggers a reporting um, requirement. And Uber claims that no credit card numbers, or social security numbers, or trip data was recovered, but um, they also paid $100,000 to keep these um, intruders quiet. And Adobe Visual Studio 2015 had a bug in it that um, someone learned about because they published a private repo and it ended up being public on GitHub and it had AWS access keys in it and all of a sudden he had $6,500 in usage fees after doing really nothing. So. His lesson learned from that experience was put your access keys in a separate config file and use git ignore to exclude them. In reality, also people are searching for credentials in GitLab and using the ones they find to steal intellectual property, even though this mischief is not generally publicized in the media. Okay, so if you start trying to solve this problem, you're going to run into two people. Um, anybody here not seen David Fifield or David Daniel Summerfield's talk 
Um, it's a very good one. Um, he goes into a, quite a bit of depth on pros and cons of various tools, so I'm not going to be repeating what he said, but uh, look for that. There's another person, Max VT, who had put together a Google Doc that lists a set of tools with uh, some details about those. And I'll also throw in that the software development section of my homepage has a significant number of resources as well. So most of what I'm going to be talking about here is going to come from these guys as well as some of the research that I had done on a previous project. So if you're going to start looking at um, tactics and procedures, um, we've got to deal with this default password problem. Like it's existed too long. There needs to be a better way for people to do the coding. Um, and if you look at, th these are like the really high level recommendations from Summerfield. You're always going to have this bootstrapping problem. If you decide the solution is encryption of the secrets, then the key has to exist somewhere. You're going to put it into a CI CD chain, then now the key has to be somewhere where Jenkins or whatever is going to be trying to access them. So you can never get rid of this bootstrapping problem. There's always going to be some starting point. So his idea or his suggestion is compartmentalize as much as you can and use tactical human intervention where necessary, try to minimize it, try to structure it by policy, and focus on audit. So again, truffle hog in the CI CD pipeline, that's one way of making sure that you're looking at these things before they get to the point of hitting GitHub. And automation of all of the tedious things, especially if you're trying to compose a large system from open source components, each one of them needing passwords, the ability to simplify rolling all those passwords, uh, revoking credentials when someone's laptop is compromised, those all require automation. And whatever you do, don't try to like, let's just go change everything that we have to deal with, or every policy that we have about dealing with secrets. Try to do it in an incremental way, bring people aboard, there's gonna be some training time, so take small steps. If you just think about, let's keep it out of a repo, Pushing is the problem. As was mentioned in the truffle hog talk, every single commit that has ever been made contains something. If the secrets are in there, you just keep layering commits on top of it. Whoever has cloned or pulled that repo has them. So if you're using Git and you explicitly add files rather than using wildcards, you reduce the chance that some temporary file is going to be included. Git status after doing git add so that you just have some feedback. These are the things that are now in the staging area. Or using git commit specific file names rather than git commit minus a. Again, try to avoid accidentally doing something that you're not really aware of. Um, git diff dash dash cached. A lot of people don't think of that. That will show you the changes in the files. Look through it methodically to see if there happens to be a comment that was left or if there was a file that shows up as being added. Um, if you just do git commit without a message, a lot of people start doing, you know, I'm going to give a message, I want to be in a hurry. That's when things will happen that you don't realize. Um, how many people here know about git what changed? It's a handy way of seeing, okay, good, at least somebody. Uh, it's a good way of seeing what files were staged, uh, what files were changed in each of the commits. The thing is, these are all discretionary policies. You've got to train your developers and make sure that they understand this is your responsibility. Take that responsibility. So you're only going to have problems if there are humans involved in coding. So that's a simple thing to fix. No, it's not. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excluding files with git ignore, as has been recommended, uh, the people that Catherine was talking about also mentioned in git rob, it's not perfect. You can have wild cards, but can you predict that I'm going to make a copy temporarily with my initials as the extension and then forget about it and accidentally commit it? That you're not going to find, or that you're not going to prevent by a policy. So a number of people are now starting to say, just move the secrets out of the code repo. Don't commit code that has a hard-coded password in it. Someone wanting to change that must then edit that file now it's in conflict with the original file. It's still in the repo. Just make them access secrets indirectly rather than hard code. 
Another way to deal with this is to just get used to minimizing the life cycle. Get used to burning the creds and restoring them each time you're going to deploy a new system if you're in development mode um, so that you don't accidentally have a long-lived secret. Uh, F5 um, has an open source project that requires a product key. That key they were trying to protect in the repo with PGP. So if somebody who had previously been trusted is revoked, they still have their private key. It was encrypted with their public key. You can't stop them from reading that file. So the lifetime of the secret must be less than the rolling over of the, the untrusted people. And that also helps when it becomes an emergency and you must now go out and rekey a lot of things. When you're choosing your tools, you have to pay really close attention to lock-in. Are you now choosing a tool that only works on AWS? Are you choosing a tool that requires that you use Chef? So these kinds of things will become a problem if you're planning on growing a small group into a larger project. And you want to look for tools that are easy to integrate, so things that may access things from the file system or by using um, command lines, so you can do inline command substitution. You can now more easily integrate with, with other tools. In terms of rolling your secrets, think about the general period of whatever the project is that you're working on. So campaigns, there is, a, there is an election that happens. As soon as the election is done, that's the time to go burn all the creds, start over again, because you're going to have turnover in staff. With academic research projects, the main thing is intellectual property theft. So at least your period of performance of your grant, but probably more frequently if you have graduate students who are coming and going over time, anybody who has left should be considered not trusted anymore. You, you can't rely on the employee system making someone who's no longer staff no longer have access. And then uh, the bigger problem is really uh, consumer devices. You've got a supply chain of tools that you're using. You may rely on upstream services, and each of those may have their own cycle for how they, they deal with, um, with secrets. So when I talk about emergencies and break glass procedures, this is not a good break glass procedure. This is not the kind that we're talking about. How many people here know that ICANN is rolling the DNSSEC key signing key in a little bit? Okay, so at least one person. <laughs> um, this is the key that signs the keys that sign the keys that allow you to have a device validate DNSSEC. Uh, they've been mentioning this for a while. They've done a survey to understand what the impact is. The impact will be minimal, but there are devices, probably guaranteed, that are out there that use DNSSEC that cannot be patched or updated that will no longer be able to validate DNS zone information. So there will be some pain from this. So let's look a little bit at some of these tools. And again, I'm kind of falling back on Daniel Summerfield's uh, way of categorizing them. His first set was the source code management integrated tools. And most of you here, if you've heard of any of these, you've heard of Blackbox or GitCrypt. And basically they're um, public-private key, use GPG, encrypt the secrets in the repo, whoever's keys were used for signing has access to them. Um, so again, they're leaving the secrets in some obfuscated form in the code repo, which is one of the downsides. Then there's the orchestration tools. So if you're doing some build automation, if you're using Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, there are solutions for each of these. Um, I haven't really looked at Barbican from OpenStack, but um, here you see that there's at least one uh, big lock-in. If you're using Chef and you want to use Citadel, Citadel requires AWS IAM. So you're, you're totally locked in on that one. Then there's Secrets as a Service. Um, how many people here are familiar with HashiCorp Vault or have ever used it? There's a few more. Um, it's probably the, well, it is the leader. It's the one that's the most popular right now. It scales really well. Uh, but it is kind of complicated to set up the recommended deployment, which is a clusterized environment for high availability. It uses consensus for the unsealing of the vault. So three out of five keys are required 
which means if the system goes down, you've got to get three people on the phone ASAP to get that thing unsealed. Otherwise, your user base is down. Uh, and I'll also note that um, Pinterest Knox here is kind of interesting in that it uses the files, the file system in files in user space, views, to expose the secrets from a remote system in the file system. So it solves the distribution problem and simplifies the access of the secrets. And then there's kind of this um, miscellaneous set here. I, I noticed that Amazon now has a secrets manager. Uh, again, it's Amazon only. Uh, Crypt is kind of interesting here because they're trying to do something similar to Vault. It's relying on etcd and console as a clusterized key value store for simplicity and um, high availability and um, backup. And Shopify uses this um, encrypted JSON mechanism. So they're using JSON, encrypting the data in it. Then there's this thing called Python Secrets, which is one of the main reasons we're here. So what is Python Secrets? It's available right now on PyPy. Um, I'll be making another release pretty soon with um, a few little changes, probably switching to calendar versioning instead of the kind of semantic versioning. The core features for the purposes of this talk is it allows you to re remove the need for default passwords. You can have a product, open source product, where the first thing you do is keys get generated passwords get generated, um, there is no default, or it doesn't need to be. It also s kind of helps with moving the secrets out of the source code base and then managing them in a way that uh, you can accommodate multiple open source components. So if you have like RabbitMQ and um, console and a couple other things, they all require some secret that mechanism to have them all be the same. Password is the same on all these things, a sort of cheap single sign-on uh, is facilitated. You can make them unique if you need to. And it uses a drop-in model. If you're familiar with like um, rsyslog.d and cron.d, a directory where you drop things into it and then in a modular way, the larger file. Or up, update.d is a, how many people here have not heard of update.d? It really makes your life easier <laughs> in being able to have your bash RC file or your um, SSH configuration file be handled by breaking it up into small parts. They're all put into one file. It supports multiple simultaneous environments. Um, HashiCorp's Terraform implemented something about a year ago that they, they called initially environments. They now call it workspaces. Allows you to have development, production, staging, and have the secrets and configuration for each one of them separated and to move between them easily. There's a program called uh, Mantle that came out of Cisco, which was an automated deployment of a whole bunch of machi uh, machine learning tools. And they have a single program, uh, secrets.py, that has built into it hard-coded prompts for each of the secrets. So if you're now going to try and integrate some new tool into that, you've got to go edit that program to add the prompts to then create the secrets.yml file, the big global file that's used for the configuration. So what Python secrets does is make it easier to then add new components without impacting anything. And hopefully then, uh, if promoted, it, it becomes a lot easier for all open source tools to, to integrate. Tools like Terraform will take secrets from environment variables and instantiate variables for the Terraform run. So Python secrets will make it easier for you to have all these secrets defined, export them, run a sub-program. Uh, you're now not even needing to put them anywhere near the code repository. They just come from the environment. So how does it work? Uh, the proof of concept for using this tool. How many people here know that NSA has a GitHub page with a whole bunch of tools on it? Very few. Um, there are some interesting things on there. Um, one of them is this thing called GoSecure, which is potentially Raspberry Pi client and server for a VPN. 
And their instructions, of course, this thing is a Raspberry Pi, it uses Raspbian, log into it with Pi, password Raspberry. Um, so I've demonstrated with Python secrets how to, to get around that problem. So what time have we got here? Three, two. Mm. There's probably time to go through them all. So one of the biggest limitations, I would say, is currently this program runs with the Python secrets module, which I probably should rename my program because Python underscore secrets is kind of confusing in comparison with Python secrets, the module. Um, that came into Python at 3.6, so you have to be using 3.6 or greater. I'd recommend doing it in a virtual environment. In this example, it's in the, the installed Python. I have 3.6 installed separate from the Mac Python to avoid breaking it. Um, help is available at a high level. I'm using the uh, OpenStack Cliff framework for command line interfaces, which is really handy. Uh, it allows you to define, oh, come on. Yep, let's get past it already. There. Uh, you can change which environment, you can change where the secrets are kept, so if you need to move them to a shared file system or something like that, it facilitates that. And then it uses subcommands, which are pretty easy to implement. They're just Python objects. So adding to this tool is, once you get used to Cliff, uh, it's pretty easy. Each command can have its own help for the unique options. So I'll be showing the templating command in a minute. In a minute. Uses Jinja templating. And there's some utilities built in, like with Amazon uh, security groups, you want to allow access for only the IP address of the system you're using. There's a way to go get your IP, add that as a variable, make direct access. And somebody tried changing my Apple password a couple days ago. So the concept of environments, um, this was done as something to facilitate the Ansible DIMS playbooks that I'll mention in a little bit, where you're instantiating a system, like going out, getting Let's Encrypt certificates, setting up a database that has the database secrets in it, and it's used by somebody on a regular basis, so there's state that needs to be kept. All the backups get kept in the secret directory. Now you've got one place where all the files are located. When you first use it, you don't have a directory. By default, it's dot secrets in your home directory. It gets created on first use, so it makes it pretty easy to, to get running. We're gonna clone the GoSecure repo. The GoSecure repo has within it a description of the variables that are required to uh, burn a SD card or flash an SD card. So go into the directory, the secrets look like a standard drop D style directory structure with YML files in it. Secrets are simple data structures in YAML. Name of the variable, the prompt that you're gonna give to the user, the type of the variable. Um, not shown here is there's a export option where you can say, I want this specific environment variable to be exported. So if you need to change the name of the variable to accommodate, um, that can be easily done. When you clone the secrets, by default the environment is gonna be created with the base name of the directory that you're in. So as long as the projects that you're working on are unique, you don't need to manually set that. So say clone from, give a directory name. Uh, by default, it tells you whenever there are variables that have not been set yet. Uh, you can then key on that to make sure that you don't try to run something and have passwords not be set. Uh, 
Um, look at the time. I, that's not going, so. What time is it? Okay, so. Um, Each open source tool that you're going to add to an environment has its secrets in its own group. You can list the groups, see how many secrets are in each one. And by default, when you show variables, you get the descriptions of the variables, the values are redacted. So if you're at a conference and you forget, uh, you don't want your AWS secret key to be copied by somebody and get $3,700 or $3,600 bill. So you have to use the dash dash no dash redact option. You'll see that there are types password and token underscore hex and string. String is something that a user provides. The other ones are types that are generable. So you start out by saying, I have this set of def defined secrets, generate me some secrets. Now you get your password. I'm using the XKCD style password, which if you're not familiar with it, get people to use it. It actually is really, really easy. Uh, in this case, four words, the initial letter of each of those words spells a four letter word. In this case, putt. So if I put a golf ball, on my screen, that will remind me P-U-U-P-U-T-T -T, um, better than having a post-it note with the real password. You can set the variables manually on the command line with a variable equals value. You can Set it from a file, put an at sign in front of it. You're going to read from the file to set the variable. So this is a way to import secrets from other places. Created a tourcon SSH key. So add that one. For very long things, Cliff requires that you do dash dash fit dash width to make everything nicely formatted on the screen. Otherwise, it goes as long as the last column goes as long as whatever the value is. Cliff is really cool. If you're a Python coder and you write APIs or CLIs, learn Cliff. And here's the solution for the mantle problem. Define the secrets, say prompt me for them, simplifies it. Okay, so enough of that. And I'll cut it off here. So how do we solve this problem of GoSecure requires passwords and pre-shared keys and things like that to make SD cards for the Raspberry Pi client and server? We do it by using Jinja templating. So in a Jinja template, plain text password is a reference to a variable. The variable is in the environment. Switch environments, regenerate, you have a different value. It's the output of the templating that has a secret in it. So what we're going to do is we have the cloud-config.client.j2 and server.j2. They're slightly different. Um, you can get fancy and put them all in one with logic, but not doing that. Oops. And GoSecure has this helper make file so that it's a little bit easier to remember what the commands are or someone who's doing this for the first time, it's simplified. We're gonna create the client and the server templates to prove that the files are created outside the repo, create a marker in the temp directory, run the find command looking for files in the dot secrets subdirectory and the current working directory. And there's nothing that's newer because we just created the marker. Create the cloud config, say make cloud-config, uh, use the templates. There is a mechanism to get a temp directory created in the environment so that you can store the file with the secrets temporarily. 
templating puts the secrets in the file. So this is the kind of thing that would accidentally get committed to GitHub and prove it's not there. And we're good. So, um, yes. You say environment path gives you the path to the environment. Add the tempter option. Creates the, the directory if it doesn't exist. Returns the path. So. Um, Sum everything up, um, you can protect with policy, you can run truffle hog to detect, but you're still gonna have some problems. So being prepared to respond and having tools to make that easy is super important. All these different tools exist. Python Secrets now exists. Getting people to use them is really hard. So I'm encouraging everybody here to reach out to anyone you know who works in some open source project and try to convince them to think about changing the way they're doing things to avoid the default password problem at least. And it's gonna take some time, some documentation will be necessary. Um, so I'm just, we're encouraging everybody here to get involved. The slides will be published in a little bit, links to all these resources, including I was talking about the Ansible DIMS playbooks for setting up a small scale distributed open source system. Um, I'm still in the process of integrating PSEC into that. So get involved, help out, pull requests encouraged. So any questions? All right, I guess everybody's hungry. <laughs> Thank you.